what's up everyone this is uh this video is the year in wrestling 1990 part two this is part two i will talk about wcw capital combat pay-per-view which was held in may i believe um in may of 1990 Yes, May 19th, 1990. Capital Combat. 1990, it was called and billed as the return of RoboCop. That was just mind-boggling that they wanted RoboCop to appear at a wrestling pay-per-view event. Very, very, very stupid. Whoever agreed to having RoboCop show up bad idea not a good idea at all I'll talk about RoboCop in a minute at Cap Capital Combat I will also talk about Clash of the Champions 10 from June 13th 1990 and Clash of the Champions 12 from September I will also talk about SummerSlam 1990 and uh, that's the only two pay-per-views and Great American Bash 1990. So I'll talk about three pay-per-views in this video. First, I'm going to just talk about some news and events that happened in 1990. Uh, 12 days. This was February 23rd, going back a little bit. My last video, I believe I ended talking about WrestleMania 6. But this was a little before WrestleMania. Uh, 12 days before, Mike Tyson defended his undisputed World Heavyweight Boxing Championship in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and he lost. Everybody knows Tyson got knocked out in a shocking upset and lost his title to Buster Douglas. Anyways, Buster Douglas replaces Mike Tyson as a special guest referee on a Saturday night's main event. Buster Douglas was the referee during the Randy Savage and Hawk Hogan match on NBC. Tyson was originally scheduled to serve as a special guest referee, but, uh, yeah... But that changed after Mike Tyson got knocked out and lost his world title to Buster Douglas. So Buster Douglas was a special ref for Hogan and Savage on February 23, 1990. It might have been a, the main event or it could have been a Saturday night's main event. I'm not sure. But it is on the network. I know that. It's on the WWE Network if you want to check it out. Buster Douglas as a special guest ref. April 13th, 1990, right after WrestleMania 6, you had All Japan and New Japan and the WWF put on a combined show in the Tokyo Dome. So All Japan, New Japan, and WWF were all involved in this show. Top matches on the show were... Hulk Hogan against Stan Hansen. Stan Hansen was in Japan for a lot of years. He was super over. Japan loved Stan Hansen. He's a legend. And uh, Stan Hansen, I think, should get in the Hall of Fame very soon. Because Stan Hansen deserves it. Anyways, Hulk Hogan took on Stan Hansen. I believe... Um, Macho King was on the show also. Jake the Snake Roberts was on the show. Ted DiBiase was on the show getting a title shot against the Ultimate Warrior, the newly crowned WWF champion at the time. The Warrior ran down to the ring in the Tokyo Dome with the WWF championship around his waist because he just beat Hulk Hogan for it. Other matches on uh, New Japan, All Japan, WWF, 
Tokyo Dome show were Bret Hart versus Tiger Mask. I believe it was Tiger Mask 2 or 3, I'm not sure. One of the Tiger Masks. And then uh, May 14th, 1990, I believe this, you know, the second Tiger Mask took his mask off in the middle of a tag match in the Tokyo Dome to re reveal his identity. Why did he do that? I don't know. Maybe he was not going to play Tiger Mask anymore, so that's why he did it. And maybe they brought in a new Tiger Mask. Probably Tiger Mask 3. There's so many Tiger Masks. I don't know what happened, but he took his mask off in the middle of a tag match. I don't know if he's retiring as Tiger Mask and a new guy was going to play Tiger Mask. I don't know. But that happened on May 14th. So now I'm going to talk about Capital Combat pay-per-view event from WCW. It was May 25th, May 19th, 1990, not May 25th, May 19th. You had a six-man tag to kick off the pay-per-view. You had uh, Road Warriors and Norman the Lunatic. Norman the Lunatic was Bastion Booger. He was never a great worker. He was a really fat guy, and he wasn't any good. But he teamed with the Road Warriors to take on Bam Bam Bigelow, Kevin Sullivan, and Cactus Jack. And the Road Warriors and Norman... The Lunatic defeated Bam Bam, Kevin Sullivan, and Cactus Jack in 9 minutes, 38 seconds. Bam Bam coming in to, uh, Capital Combat was his first pay-per-view in WCW since Starcade 88. Why did Bam Bam come in? Why was he... He was hired in May and June, in July, and then he was gone from WCW after that. He had a three-month run in WCW. I don't. I'm sure he knew if he was coming back from Japan, he knew he couldn't return to the WWF because he had a lot of heat at the time in the WWF. So he knew he couldn't go there back there. So he went to the WCW, and he was around for only three months, and then he was gone. Why was he gone so quick? I don't know. Probably was a contract dispute. Up next, you had Mark Callis, Mean Mark, a.k.a. The Undertaker, defeating Johnny Ace in 10 minutes. It was an okay match. It was good to see Undertaker. He was very young. He was like oh, just about a rookie. I'm, I think he was in the business three, four years by 1990, but he was really young, and he was a big, impressive young athlete why did WCW let him go I'll never know they should have never let Undertaker Mark Calloway go but the people that were running WCW at the time had no brains so of course they let the Undertaker go because they had nothing for him and Vince did he created the Undertaker gave it to Mark Calloway up next, you had the Samoan SWAT team defeat Tommy Rich and Mike Rotundo in a tag match. In a hair versus hair match, you had Paul Ellering, Road Warriors manager, pinning Teddy Long in a minute 57 seconds. It was pretty boring. It was a pointless match to put on a pay-per-view. I believe Teddy Long got his head shaved, and that was kind of entertaining. But Teddy Long has always been a great entertainer, great manager. But that match with him and Paul Ellering was very stupid to have on a pay-per-view. Up next, the Midnight Express defeat the U.S. Tag Team Champions Tom Zink, the Z-Man, and Brian Pillman to win the U.S. Tag Team titles. It was a great tag match. Both those teams... Every time they had tag matches, both those teams put on great matches all the time. So Midnight Express become the new U.S. Tag Team Champions. 
at Capital Combat. Up next, you had the Rock and Roll Express in another tag match defeat the Fabulous Freebirds in 18 minutes. 33 seconds, I think that went on too long. It was an okay tag match, what I remember of it, and that's all I got to say about it. Up next, you had Doom with their manager, Teddy Long. Doom was the team of Butch Reed and Ron Simmons defeating the Steiner brothers for the world tag team title. So Doom becomes the new WCW tag team champions, and after they won the tag titles, they had them for a very long time, almost a year, over a year. I think over or at least 10 months they had the tag team titles, maybe less. I should look it up in this book. So Ron Simmons and Butch Reed Doom won the titles May 19th, 1990, and they lost them on March 9th, 1991. So that's a 10-month title run, very long run. And but do the team of Doom was a great team. Steiners also a great team. Well, Steiners one of the greatest teams in WCW history, in my opinion. So you had new U.S. Tag Champs, new Tag Team Champs on Capital Combat. Uh, up next was the main event NWA or WCW NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair defending the title against U.S. Champion Lex Luger in a Thunderdome cage match. Ric Flair wins by disqualification. In 17 minutes, 21 seconds, I believe the horseman, the horseman did come out, interfered. They got the Thunderdome cage lifted up so they could climb under. And uh, I think Barry Windham and Arn Anderson got in the cage, started beating on Lex Luger. They put the cage back down. Sting, he was out with an injury still. And he hurt his knee at a Clash of Champions 10. Sting was still injured, but he could walk, and he was getting healthier and healthier. Sting comes out to try to get in the Thunderdome cage with El Gigante, a giant, giant of a man, a real giant in the history of wrestling. El Gigante, he was like seven foot seven. They build him as seven foot seven. I don't know if he's really seven foot seven. That seems, I think they made that up. He probably wasn't, but maybe he was that tall. I never saw him in person, so I don't know. I just saw him on TV. Anyways, Ellie Gante debuted, walked down to the ring with Sting, dressed in some really god-awful wrestling gear. He had like a headband on, and he had all these sparkles, uh, gray sparkles with red and his outfit and wrestling gear was god awful. Looked like he was some character out of Star Wars. Anyways, Elegante and Sting come down. They can't get in the cage. The four horsemen then push Sting in a tiny little cage, in like a shark cage. They push Sting in a shark cage, close the door on him. The door would not even lock, folks. They didn't have a lock on the door, so it was very stupid to put Sting in a cage. Because Robocop, then Robocop, comes out, walks down to the ring to save Sting. I guess they wanted Robocop there just to save Sting. Very stupid idea to have Robocop involved in on a wrestling pay-per-view. Very stupid idea. Just idiotic and pointless. But uh, RoboCop movies, I enjoyed them. I, I loved RoboCop. Part 1 and Part 2 were good. Part 3 was not good. But I enjoyed Part 1 and 2. And the new RoboCop, even the remake, I enjoyed. But that's because I was a RoboCop fan of the movies when I was a kid.
So I enjoyed the remake of RoboCop. I know a lot of people probably did not. Back to Capo Combat. RoboCop comes out, tries to get Sting out of the cage. Basically starts bending the bars, which looked like just very weak and cheap plastic. RoboCop bends a bar like that. Like he has some magic powers and he, he's super strong. So he bends the steel bars and they were not steel. And then basically when he bent the bar there was no lock on the door. And the door basically was already off the hinges. And it was never, it never had hinges. The door just falls off and Robocop basically moves the door. And Sting gets out of the cage. Ric Flair wins by DQ. Goes up the aisle. Tony Schiavone interviews Ric Flair. He's bleeding all over the place. His uh, blonde hair is red. And uh, he's screaming on the microphone at Tony Schiavone. He's screaming. He's showing the world title saying he's the man. No one can take it from him. And then Sting gets to Ric Flair in the aisle. Uh, knocks him over. Starts drilling Ric Flair with right hands. And gets broken up. And that's the end of Capital Combat. Was a decent pay per view. Wasn't the best. But there were uh, like three, two good tag matches on it. And the world tag titles and US tag titles were good. And the main event, Lex Luger and Ric Flair, was good because Ric Flair always brought the best out of Luger and they put on a good match inside a ca Thunderdome cage. So, Capital Combat was okay. Wasn't that bad. Up next, talk about Great American Bash 1990 WCW pay-per-view from Baltimore, Maryland. And then I'll talk about some uh, WWF Ultimate Warrior, I'll just talk about it before Great American Bash. Ultimate Warrior, after he won the title from Hogan at WrestleMania 6, he defended it for the first time. His first title defense was against Mr. Perfect. And it's on a Coliseum Home Video, a old WWF Coliseum Home Video release. I own it. I don't have it with me, but it's up in my room. Uh, it's a battle it's called the battle of the wwf superstars video and they show the ultimate warriors first wwf title defense and it's against mr perfect aka kurt hanning one of the great workers of all time so warrior defends his title for the first time retains against a good very good opponent in mr perfect and then I'll talk about a Saturday night's main event that happened in July of 1990 after I talk about this Great American Bash in 1990. I lost the page. Okay. Dark match. Great American Bash was David Sierra. I don't know who that is. I've never seen him in WCW, and I've watched every WCW pay-per-view from 1990 and a lot of other shows like Saturday Nights and Power Hours, and I never saw David Sierra defeated Mr. X. Who the hell is Mr. X? I don't know. It's probably a guy wearing a black mask. That was a dark match. Thank God it wasn't on the Great American Bash pay-per-view. But there were a few matches on the Great American Bash. There were two that I can think of off of my head. Two that should have not been on the pay-per-view. Uh, first match is Brian Pillman defeated Buddy Landell. Thank God, because Buddy Landell calling himself the Nature Boy. This is what I thought of that. Buddy Landell sucked. I was never a fan of his. He was an okay wrestler, but... I was never a fan of the guy, and he should have never held the Nature Boy name. That is only reserved for Buddy Rogers and Ric Flair. I don't know how Buddy Landell got the Nature Boy name and got someone to agree to let him use it. 
Up next, Mike Rutundo. Uh, I believe at the time they were calling him Captain. Captain Mike Rutundo. Everybody knows he's IRS. And he went to WWF in 91 and became IRS. Had a tag title run with Ted DiBiase. And he's Bray Wyatt's and Bo Dallas's father is Mike Rutundo and he's Barry Windham's brother. So he's a long history in the business. He's a good worker too. Uh, so Mike Rutundo defeated the Iron Sheik in 6 minutes, 46 seconds. That match should have not been on pay-per-view. Iron Sheik was in no shape to be on pay-per-view wrestling for a major wrestling company at the time like WCW or WWF. Iron Sheik had no business being on the Great American Bash pay-per-view period. Uh, thank God it was only six minutes long. Up next, Doug Furness. Later on, 96, 97, he went to WWF. He was also in Japan. I believe in New Japan Pro Wrestling for a long time. Or not New Japan, I think he's in All Japan Pro Wrestling. It was Doug Furness for a while in the early 90s before he went to WWF. And he was also for a tiny bit in ECW in 97 working tag matches with his partner. Doug Furness defeated Tommy Rich in six minutes. Tommy Rich should have not been in the ring he didn't look healthy, and it was awful. But glad Doug Furness got the win. He's a great athlete and a talented guy. Up next, the Midnight Express defending the U.S. Tag Team titles in a good tag match. Defeat the Southern Boys in 18 minutes. The Southern Boys were, what's his name? Tracy Smothers worked in ECW as a FBI member Tracy Smothers also worked in the WWF as Freddie Joe Floyd in 96 I believe so Tracy Smothers was in WCW in 90, 1990 and 91 in 92 as the Southern Boys and they were a pretty good team they worked well together his tag partner I believe was one of the Armstrong brothers I think it was Scott Armstrong I'm not positive but it was one of the Armstrongs. It might have been Steve. Steve Armstrong was Tracy Smothers' partner, and they were the Southern Boys. The Midnight Express defeated them to retain the U.S. tag titles. It was a good tag match. And it went 18 minutes long. Check it out if you have the network. Up next, you had... Big Van Vader making his WCW pay-per-view debut defeat the Z-Man in two minutes. It was a pretty awesome to see Vader come out, make his debut. It was pretty damn awesome. I'm a big Vader fan. And Vader definitely deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, WWE Hall of Fame, at least. Hopefully he gets in in 2016. I'm a big Vader fan. So Vader destroyed Tom Zink. The Z-Man in two minutes. And that was the right call. Up next, the Steiner Brothers defeated the Freebirds in 13 minutes. It was an okay tag match. Uh, a lot of suplexes from the Steiners, from Rick Steiner and Scott. They were one of the best teams of all time. And so the Steiners, just about in any match on pay-per-view back in the early 90s, they were very good, and they had good tag matches with any team. Up next, you had a six-man tag, JYD, Junkyard Dog. This, I believe, was his pay-per-view debut. He, did, he was at Capital Combat 90 in an interview segment with Jim Cornette, but he didn't wrestle. So JYD, he was pretty out of shape, but... He was uh he was still over with the crowd. I think he's in his early forties or maybe thirty nine or thirty eight years old at the time of the Great American Bash ninety. JYD, LA Gante and Paul Orndorff. 
defeated the four horsemen of the team of Sid Vicious, Barry Windham, and Arn Anderson by disqualification in 8 minutes, 53 seconds. It wasn't that great of a six-man. The only guy that could work on uh, the babyface team was Paul Orndorff, and JYD was not really a great worker at this time in 1990, in the summer of 1990. He was not a great worker. But Paul Orndorff still could go. Uh, Sid could go. He was a young young guy in the business at the time. Barry Windham could go, and Arn Anderson could go with anybody. So they win by DQ against the Horsemen. Up next, Lex Luger defending the U.S. title defeated Mean Mark Callis for the U.S. title, and he retains... And it was an okay match. Undertaker was very young in it. If you go back and watch it on the network, Undertaker looks very young. I believe Paul Heyman came down to the ringside with him. Also cut a promo. Standing with me, Mark, and Gordon Soli. So Paul Heyman was managing the Undertaker at Great American Bash 1990. Taker and Paul Heyman both look very young. And it's funny to watch now. Uh, Doom, tag team titles on the line. The team of Doom defeated the Rock and Roll Express. It was a good tag match. Main event was Ric Flair defending the world title against Sting. And this was passing the torch. Ric Flair, the nature boy, passed the torch to Sting and really helped out Sting. By losing to him and giving the world title to Sting, it basically skyrocketed Sting's career. Was already everybody knew already Sting was going to be a star, but him defeating Ric Flair just put him on top of the mountain in the wrestling world. And Sting won his first world title, Great American Bash, July seventh, nineteen ninety. Uh, another funny thing. About Sting winning the world title, his tag team partner, the guy he started with in the wrestling business, the guy he started with, the Ultimate Warrior. They started as a tag team, the Blade Runners. And they worked in Mid South Wrestling, UWF. UWF was Mid South, but I guess they changed the name to UWF. They worked in Memphis territory where Jerry Lawler was and J Jerry Jarrett was so to have two guys Sting and Warrior they started the business together they started in the business together as a tag team to have them both in the year of 1990 to have both of them win world titles is very impressive and pretty damn cool Warrior won it before Sting in uh, April 1990, Warrior got the world title first. And then in July 1990, Sting got his first world title. So that's pretty damn awesome, I think. Pretty damn cool story. And Sting said on uh, the documentary on the Ultimate Warrior after he passed away. I forgot what it was called, but it's on the network. And it's a Warrior documentary something I don't remember the name but it, on the warrior documentary Sting brought up when he watched and saw warrior win his world title from Hogan Sting said he was jealous jealous and I don't blame him I would have been jealous too so that was pretty cool for Sting to say when after he watched it and watched warrior win the title he, that he was jealous and I believe Sting would have been a huge star if he would have worked for WWF and went there in 89 or 90. He would have been a huge, huge star. Way bigger than he was in WCW. Because they didn't have the audience that the WWF had until 96, 97, 98. So Sting wins a world title. That was fucking great. I thought, and I really enjoyed it. I was already a Sting Mark, 
But him beating Ric Flair just made me become more of a Sting fan. Up next, I'll talk about Clash of Champions from June 13th. I know I just talked about Great American Bash. I was in July, but I'll go back to June. Talk about Clash of Champions 11 from Charleston, South Carolina. First match had the Southern Boys defeat the Freebirds. Decent tag. Crowd for uh, Clash of Champions 11. It was a great crowd. Hot crowd. They were really into all the matches and the whole show. When the crowd's in the the entire show in a lot of the matches it makes the entire show better and it makes it just way better to watch when a crowd's into a show up next Tommy Rich defeated Bam Bam Bigelow Bam Bam Bigelow one of his last appearances I believe was at Clash of Champions 11 because after Clash of Champions 11 I didn't see Bam Bam on any other WCW pay-per-views for the rest of 1990, Bam Bam did not appear until uh, World War III in 98. He came back, feuded with Goldberg. Up next, you had Mike Rotundo and Tom Zink defeat the Samoan SWAT team. And then, up next, you had Mark Callis, The Undertaker, defeat Brian Pillman. Pretty good match. Could have went a little longer. Up next, very good tag match. Uh, it's on the network. Rock and Roll Express defeat the Midnight Express by DQ. But it was great tag team wrestling for sure. That's on uh, Clash of Champions 11 if you want to check it out on the network. Check out Midnight Express Rock and Roll. That's a great match. Best match on Clash of Champions 11. Up next, Barry Windham defeated Doug Furness. And then you had a U.S. title match. Uh, Lex Luger defeated Sid Vicious very fast. Yeah, I think it was under a minute, or it may have been a minute, 20 seconds. I don't know why. Sid must have been injured because Lex Luger ran in the ring. I believe he clotheslined Sid and pinned him 1, 2, 3 and retained the title very quick, very fast. That was pretty stupid, but... They must have done it for a reason. NWA ta World Tag Team Champions, or, or whatever they were calling them, WCW Tag Team Champions, Doom defeated the Steiner Brothers. Very good tag match. It's entertaining as hell to watch. And it's on Clash of Champions 11. Paul Orndorff pinned Arn Anderson. And then you had, in the main event, Ric Flair defending the world title before he lost it a month later to Sting. Ric Flair defended against the Junkyard Dog. So JYD got a title shot and beat Ric Flair by disqualification when Ole Anderson interfered, one of the horsemen. And then you had a lot of guys come out. Lex Luger came out. I think Brian Pillman came out. And they were all fighting against the horsemen. The dudes with attitude, they were calling them. JYD, Paul Orndorff, Sting, and the Steiners, I believe, were the dudes with attitude. And then, uh, anyways, they're fighting the horsemen. Rick Sting comes out. He was, he might have been a little bit injured still, but a month later he was ready to go again and wrestle. And he did wrestle his first match at Bash 90. Sting comes in the ring. He looked healthy. And they closed the show with Ric Flair backing down in the corner, cowering away from Sting, basically going like this, don't hit me. And then he starts chopping Sting, chopping him on the chest. Sting gets fired up, basically fires himself up. The crowd's with him. Gets in the corner, starts pounding on Ric Flair. Punching him in the face over and over and over. Hip tosses him out from the corner. Hip toss. Same spot they've done for years and years in all their matches. And Sting may have even back dropped him or drop kicked him. And then Clash of Champions 11 ends. It was a good show. Pretty entertaining show. If you have the network, check it out.
Alright, Clash of Champions 11. Up next, I'll talk about Saturday Night's main event from July 1990. I don't have every match in front of me. The only match I'm going to talk about that I think is worth talking about is Ultimate Warrior defending the WWF title against Rick Rude. It happened on July 1990, Saturday night's main event for the WWF Championship. And uh, Rick Rude and Warrior always had great matches. I think that was thanks to Rick Rude because he was a great fucking worker. And uh, just a tremendous talent. So Warrior defends against Rick Rude. I believe he pinned him clean. I don't think it was a DQ, but it could have been. But Warrior defeats Rick Rude. July 90, Saturday Night's Main Event. Up next, I'll talk about SummerSlam. WWF SummerSlam 1990. I didn't write the matches down, so I'm reading them out of this book I have. It shows every pay-per-view. WWF and WCW ever put on up until 2002. <coughs> okay, SummerSlam 90 was held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was a hot crowd. There's always great hardcore fans in Philly. And it was a great crowd. Dark Match saw Power and Glory. Hercules and Paul Roma defeat the Rockers. Says, er, that wasn't a dark match. It was on pay-per-view. My fault. So, Power and Glory defeat the Rockers to kick off SummerSlam 90. Sensational Sherry defeated Sapphire by forfeit when Sapphire failed to show up to the match. They were doing a storyline where I believe Ted DiBiase was paying off and uh, buying all these gifts for Sapphire. Later on in the pay-per-view, she did show up with like a fur coat on like she sold out. And she sold out for the American Dream Dusty Rhodes and she went with Ted DiBiase, I guess, because of the money. Everybody has a price, says Ted DiBiase. And he basically bought Sapphire to leave Dusty Rhodes. And Dusty was pretty angry and pretty crushed. They showed him in the back. He was uh, running after a limo. I believe Sapphire was in a limo with Ted DiBiase. And Dusty started running after it, screaming uh, Sapphire, screaming her name. He was crushed that Sapphire left him. So... That was a storyline between Dusty and Ted DiBiase at the time. I don't know if Dusty was a uh, wrestling. I don't think he wrestled on SummerSlam 90. He was just involved in that segment and storyline with Ted DiBiase and Sapphire. And Sherry was also involved in it. Because she started managing Ted DiBiase. Or she started managing him, I believe... By SummerSlam 90. I know she did in 91. Or late. After WrestleMania 7. Sherry started managing. Ted DiBiase. Because at WrestleMania 7. Sherry was still managing the Macho Man. But that's about that's in 91. I'll talk about 91 in future videos. After 1990. Up next. You had the Warlord defeat Tito Santana. Pretty damn boring match. Tito, great worker. Warlord, not great worker. But it was a decent match. The Warlord was just a big muscled up bodybuilder looking guy. Couldn't really work work a match. Was never a great wrestler or a great worker. Tito Santana was. Former Intercontinental Champ. Former Tag Champ. Hall of Famer. So I just I felt bad for Tito that he was even in a match with the warlord and had to try to pull a good match out of the guy because the warlord could not work 
in my opinion. Not saying I could work, but I think I could do better than the Warlord. Up next, Jake the Snake defeated Bad News Brown in four minutes. Big Boss Man was the guest referee for that match. And Big Boss Man was a babyface at the time of SummerSlam 90. Nikolai Volkov and Hacksaw Jim Duggan were tag team partners. They defeated the Orient Express in uh, three minutes, two, 22 seconds, very quick match. Shouldn't even been on the pay-per-view SummerSlam. Randy Savage defeated Dusty Rhodes. So Dusty Rhodes was on SummerSlam 90. Uh, Randy defeated Dusty in 2 minutes, 15 seconds. I believe Dusty Rhodes was counted out. Or maybe he was pinned. I don't remember. Anyways, Dusty Rhodes had his mind on other things. He had his mind on Sapphire and where she, where she was and what she was doing with Ted DiBiase. So that's probably why Dusty lost so fast to Randy Savage. He probably ran off to the back to look for Sapphire and got counted out. I'm not sure if he's counted out. Maybe I should watch it back tonight. Carrie Von Erich, the Texas Tornado. A uh, legend, great worker, Kerry Von Erich was when he was straight and not on drugs. He was a great wrestler, great worker. Kerry Von Erich defeated Mr. Perfect to win the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, crowd loved it. They popped huge. They loved Texas Tornado winning the IC title. Uh, best two out of three falls, or... Best of three falls match. Whatever that means. Same thing as two out of three falls in my opinion. Best of three falls match. The Heart Foundation were the challengers defending the demolition. Not defending. Heart Foundation was taking on the demolition for the tag team titles. At this time of SummerSlam 90 they made the demolition. Were the team of three guys which was stupid. I love Demolition just with Axe and Smash alone as a team. And then they had to make Demolition a three-man team and add Crush. Crush was a young guy, big guy. Uh, he looked impressive, and he did have some athleticism and some wrestling skills. So they added Crush to the Demolition team. They were a three-man team. I believe Axe was hiding under the ring. During the match, he actually came out during the match, or they might have cheated. I think they did, of course, Demolition did cheat because they were a three-man team during the match, and they got a fall on the Hart Foundation by cheating. And then, I believe, Brett, or the Advil, Jim Neidhart, the Anvil, Jim Neidhart, one of them pulled Axe out from under the ring, and he was exposed from hiding under the ring. And also during this match, you had the Road Warriors basically making their WWF pay-per-view debut. They weren't wrestling, but they did show up. So, where is this page now? Okay, Road Warriors did show up during this tag title match. They came out. I believe they drilled Crush. That was Crush was on the top rope. They drilled him with a clothesline, and he fell, and he uh, straddled the top rope. So he was injured. And then the Hart Foundation pinned and defeated the Demolition to win the WWF Tag Team Titles from Demolition. Road Warriors help helped Hart Foundation. Helped out for sure of them winning the tag titles. And then in the back, I don't know who was interviewing them. It could have been Sean Mooney or Gene Oakland. They inter did an interview with the Hart Foundation and the Road Warriors together. It was a classic promo. Great interview by uh, Hawk and Animal. They always had great, clever stuff that they said in their interviews. So, Hart Foundation winning tag titles. Up next, you had 
the steel cage match. Main of, not the main event, but it was close to the main event. It was like a double main event. I believe it was a double main event they were calling SummerSlam 90. Steel cage match for the WWF Championship. The Ultimate Warrior defeated Rick Rude in 10 minutes. Should have went longer. Could have went longer, but it didn't. Uh, it was a great match. What I remember of it, it was a damn good match. Rick Rude, great worker. Could pull a good match on any, anybody, just about. So, Ultimate Warrior retains the WWF title, defeating Rick Rude in the steel cage. Main event, last match. Hulk Hogan defeated the Earthquake by countout in 13 minutes, 16 seconds. What I remember about that, that match is a big boss man coming out. I believe it was a big boss man. I haven't watched SummerSlam 90. I haven't watched Earthquake versus Hogan in years and years. So I'm just going off the top of my head. I could be wrong. I believe the big boss man came out, uh, drilled Earthquake really hard with a plastic chair on his back and drilled him in the back. The hard plastic chair. And uh, Earthquake had these red lines across his back. His back was basically bleeding. Looked like he had a rash on his back from getting drilled with really hard by the big boss man in that plastic chair. So I remember Earthquake having these giant red marks and giant scratches and blood on his back from getting hit by the boss man. And, uh... It was a classic Hulk Hogan match. Uh, you had a monster heel to work with Hogan. And it was great. And Hogan wins by countout. Good decision to have Hogan win by countout. To make the earthquake, which he was new at the time in the WWF. To make the earthquake still look strong. Uh, earthquake was on WrestleMania 6. So... He was there already for a while. And I believe he debuted in maybe late 89. Uh, I don't know. But Earthquake was a great guy. Super nice guy from what I've heard. It's a damn shame he passed away. I think he's in his uh, early 50s. or Early 50s or late 40s. He was a young guy. Damn shame he passed away. So that was SummerSlam 90. Pretty damn good show. You had an IC title change. You had a tag team title change. The crowd was great. They were into the entire show. And uh, that's the two matches that stand out to me. Heart Foundation winning and Texas Tornado winning. And Rick Rude and Warrior in a cage. That was a great match also. So now I'll talk about... I know this video is already over 45 minutes. I apologize. I will talk about uh, Clash of Champions 12. And then I'll be done with part 2. If you stuck around and have watched this entire video, thank you very much. You did not have to. And I apologize that it's long. But I had a lot of stuff. A lot of events to talk about. September 5th, 1990 was Clash of the Champions 12. I believe they're calling it Fall Brawl. Later on, Fall Brawl became a WCW pay-per-view. Anyways, first match, Jackie... Jackie Fulton and Terry Taylor defeated the Nasty Boys in a tag match. Nasty Boys, this was their first Clash of Champions and their first real exposure that I saw of them. I did not see them in the AWA. I knew they were in the AWA, but I didn't see them there. I was too young, and I did not watch the AWA when it was on ESPN because I didn't have cable at the time. So, Nasty Boys on TBS... And then after Clash of Champions 12 in October, they were at Halloween Havoc against the Steiners. And a damn good tag match. 
Up next, Tommy Rich defeated Bill Irwin. That match should have not been out of clash, but it was. Uh, ladies, I guess, whatever this stands for, LPWA Ladies Pro Wrestling. Uh, I don't know what the A stands for, Association. Women's champ, Susan Saxton, defeated Bambi. Whatever her name was, Bambi. So, that match was boring. U.S. Tag Titles. The Steiners. Or I don't know if the tag titles were on the line, but the Steiners were the U.S. Tag Team Champions. They must have defeated the Mina Express after Bash 90. The Steiners were U.S. Tag Champs, and they defeated Maximum Overdrive. Some jobber tag team that was in WCW in 1990. Um, Stan Hansen. The, the great Stan Hansen defeated the Z-Man. U.S. champion. U.S. title was on the line. U.S. champion Lex Luger defeated Ric Flair by DQ. What I remember from this match, it was damn good. Flair and Luger put on great matches in 1990. They had a match at Wrestle War 90, Capital Combat 90, and Clash of Champions 12, and they were all, three of them were great matches, and Clash 12 was a great match between Flair and Luger again for the U.S. title. Main event was Sting against a, the Black Scorpion, some guy wearing a mask, calling himself the Black Scorpion. It wasn't the real Black Scorpion because the real one showed up at Star K90, which I'll talk about in Part 3 of the Year in Wrestling 1990. Uh, next Part 3 video, the last video of 1990, where I talk about the Year in Wrestling 1990, I will talk about... Saturday night's main event from October 1990 and I'll talk about Survivor Series 1990 and Star K90 and uh, Clash of Champions that took place in November 1990 all these events I've talked about all the Clash of Champions Saturday night main events WCW pay-per-views WWF SummerSlam 90 you can watch them all on the network um, I'm not promoting the network, uh, maybe I am, maybe some will say I am, but the network is only $9.99. If you're a hardcore wrestling fan and you got the, t the time, you got free time to watch, get the network. It's got everything on there, a lot of stuff on there. I wish they'd put more Raws from 97 and uh, Ross from 99 in 2000, but they won't. They only have a very a couple from 97 on there. They have the entire year of 96, but I'm not going to watch the entire year of 96. I've only watched a few from 96. 95 Ross they got in there, 94 Ross they got in there, the entire years. In 93, they got the entire years. I have not... I've only watched probably one or two 1995 Raws. 1995 was a pretty boring, bad, bad year for WWF. It was not a good year to be watching and to be a fan of WWF, but I was still a fan. I watched all their pay-per-views in 95 because I was like 11 or 12 years old and I was a kid and I was still in the WWF. Even though their gimmicks that I look back on now were god awful and they were running and their entire show was gimmick city you had Doink the Clown, Duke the Dumpster, all that crap I mean Mantar, Aldo Montoya, all that stupid shit it was too many gimmicks too cartoonish but I still watched in 95 because I was a HBK fan and I was a Diesel fan I'll admit it. I was a Diesel fan. So, part three uh, it will be coming up. 
I will be uploading part three of 1990 probably on Saturday or Sunday this weekend if people want to check it out. This was part two of the year in wrestling 1990. If you watched it, thanks for watching. If you follow me on Twitter, thank you for following me. I'm at TNA WWE Guy. I'm out of here. Peace out, everybody.